Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome back to Comic Commentary, tie-in issues, Young Justice Outsiders, 1 and 2. In this series, we'll be reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics, Young Justice Outsiders tie-in comics. We're not sure how they're going to keep going with this naming convention that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. Uh, my name is Rich, and I'm here with my co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In Comics Commentary, we will, we will be discussing how the tie-in comics relate to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the first half of season three of Young Justice Outsiders, as well as the broader DC universe. But unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's issue are Torch Songs, Parts 1 and 2. The issue release dates were January 2nd and 3rd of 2019, and the timestamp was all of this taking place on August 8th of Team Year 6. And the episode tie-in is that it's set about a month after the end of Season 2. The writer for this issue was Greg Weissman, the penciler Christopher Jones, inker Christopher Jones, colors were done by Kelly Fitzpatrick, and the letterer was Wes Abbott. Just in time for your next mission. So the establishing shot for these issues is that on the Watchtower, we see Miss Martian, Beast Boy, Batgirl, and Superboy gathering together to prep for their next mission. Batgirl informs the team that Simon is back in the U.S., but the fact that they have footage of him in the airport means that he's probably setting them up for a trap. Throughout this debrief, McGann and Connor have both been pretty on edge around each other, with Superboy going so far as to accuse McGann of putting Simon back into another coma. The awkwardness is so palpable that Connor even overhears Batgirl and Beast Boy gossiping about he how he and McGann got along great on Mars before this whole new cold shoulder routine they've got going on. However, they're all saved from talking about their feelings by heading to their new mission. And the team arrives at Good World Studios Film Festival and split up to track down Simon. Megan and Garfield, in the form of a mouse in her pocket, sneak into a Q&A with Sandra Stanion classic film star and the actress who played Megan Wheeler's mom on Hello, Megan. Beast Boy encourages McGann to ask about the show, but it's, re it's reassurance from Connor, who also snuck into the panel, that makes her finally raise her hand. A question about Marie Logan leads to Sandra pointing out how much Megan looks like her, and then Garfield pipes up to confirm that she is Marie's daughter, and they all agree to grab lunch together after the panel. And despite Connor's help, there's still some tension between he and McGann. It's real awkward. Elsewhere in the convention center, Batgirl runs into Simon, who informs her there's nothing she can do to stop him since he's, <laughs> un he's <Bwah> there. <laughs> since he's there under a Bialian diplomatic passport and has blocked her psychic connection to McGann. So not a good situation. Megan is currently reminiscing about Hello, Megan with Sandra Stanion, and just like that, Simon psychically attacks her, trapping McGann, Connor, Garfield, and Sandra in McGann's mind, which looks a lot like an episode of Hello, Megan. <laughs> and part two opens with Connor trying to talk McGann out of this, but she's a little too lost in the whole Megan Wheeler role for him to get through to her. Back on the material plane, Simon tells Bad Girl that all he really did was lead McGann's psyche toward a pocket of safety in her own mind so that her own insecurities could keep her trapped without any further work from him. And then he brain blasts Barbara into unconsciousness. <laughs> and back in Hello, Megan. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Hello, Megan. I love it. Yep. Connor and Garfield, who's currently stuck as a frog <laughs> for some reason, try to brainstorm a way to snap McGann out of this. Apparently, in this episode, Megan Wheeler has the big song in the school show, but she's nervous about messing it up. Classic sitcom shenanigans ensue. <laughs> but apparently, she's also worried about Connor not liking the song and never forgiving her. Mm. Garfield recognizes this as a deviation from the Hello, Megan script, a little bit of the real McGann talking. Apparently, she needs forgiveness from Connor, the real Connor, Connor Kent. Superboy insists that he's got nothing to forgive her for, except maybe that she tried to psychically mess with his memories back before season two. 
Uh, And Garfield points out not only how horrible that is, and Connor agrees, pointing out that it's why he broke up with her in the first place, but that they've been through a lot since then, and she took responsibility for her actions and apologized, but technically he never actually forgave her. (laughs) Beast Boy tells him he doesn't have to forgive her, but that if he does, he needs to be sincere about it, because he and McGann were together long enough to know when he's lying. And back in the physical world, in the convention center, Simon's gotten away and Batgirl discovers the unconscious bodies of McGann, Connor, Garfield, and Sandra. Back in Hello, Megan, McGann and friends get ready for the show backstage. Connor tries to talk to McGann, but before he can, she's pushed out onto stage to perform her big number. But instead of whatever song everyone was expecting, McGann sings a torch song, an emotional ballad lamenting what she did to Connor. When she comes off stage, Connor finally has the chance to talk to her, telling her that he doesn't know where they're going or what's going to happen, but that he forgives her for everything. And that bit of sincerity is enough to snap McGann out of it and for all of them to wake up safe and sound back in the convention center. Uh, It's a lot. Yeah, there's this is kind of the thing that I needed for sure. So let's let's dive into that and talk about it with Semaster. Okay. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. This is all you. If this was set underwater, then I could also talk about this, but it's pretty much this was written to Emily. <laughs> so you're take the lead on this one. Okay. I have I have a lot of thoughts on this, and I have a lot of things that I do really love about this issue, but I do want to start off with because of the number of times I have reread this issue, I don't think it's the strongest tie-in comic. But I still really enjoy it, and I feel like it just needed more time with this storyline. Like, it needed a full two-issue arc to really explore this idea more fully. They had the equivalent of 20 comic pages, which is one issue, (laughs) to try and wrap their heads around this whole thing. But, like, to deal with both Connor and McGann fully processing their stuff, maybe having McGann have to come to terms with, like, the idea that she could stay in this perfect Hello Megan reality that she's has or she could go live in the imperfect but real world outside of it and having her make that choice and giving her that agency i would have loved to see something like that but i don't think they had time to do those things right those other little things that might have made the story a little stronger overall are kind of missing so i understand some people may have thought this wasn't as strong a story as it could be but i still really do enjoy it so i wanted to get my my negative thoughts out first and then dive into how much I still really love this issue, even if it isn't perfect. <laughs> I think it's like with a lot of uh, Young Justice for me in general, like we're getting the story they need to focus on, but you know there's so much more, yeah. right? There's so many layers and so many levels. And if they're going to like, okay, we're going to tell the story and we're going to get it. We have one issue. They've given us one issue to do this with, yeah. you know, then let's do this, right? Yes. But it could have been a, if they had done a comic book version of like what they were doing with the series where it could be a 23 minute episode or a 30 minute episode, whatever they need to tell the story, yeah. then they could, they could have had more pages and just said, Hey, we're doing a 40 page special or whatever. Yes. And then doing that. But I don't think they had that option. Yes. I understand that they didn't have that option. I just wish they had. No, no. I so I'm, I'm totally agreeing with you. I more space to breathe is Absolutely. really the only thing I'm asking for. It, yeah. Not an, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you a hundred percent. They yes. needed more. But aside from that, there are all of the little things about this issue that I love and I know a lot of other people did. I received so many messages online asking me what I thought about McGann's hair. I like it. She has long hair in this issue for no reason other than she can to make all of us stop screaming about how McGann changes her hair with emotional trauma. And maybe she just changes her hair sometimes. But I liked seeing her with long hair again. It was nice. It was cute. It was a nice little throwback nostalgia that ties into everything else this this issue is doing with that. There is, at one point, Barbara mentions that the 1K Wordsworth app exists in this universe. Yes. I I looked stuff up. I was like, is it it a reference to William Wordsworth? Like, I'm trying to figure out what this is. And I ask Emily. And it's not an Easter egg or anything. It's just a pun. That took me five read-throughs to get, because a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> so it's the Young Justice version of Instagram, and it's a I pun. Have, I have nothing for that. <laughs> I was so like, I had full, full speed facepalm when you said that to me. <laughs> 
Uh, there's also, there's so many great little, little nods to classic cinema scattered around the convention center for the movie festival that they're all at. Uh, like there is a Phantom of the Opera cosplayer taking a picture with someone like the old school Universal Monsters Phantom of the Opera. Mm -hmm. There is a Charlie Chaplin cardboard cutout in the background. There Mm -hmm. is a woman in one corner whose dress looks like it's out of My Fair Lady. It's not exactly right, but I was like, that dress looks familiar couple searches later, I'm like, it looks very close to Eliza Doolittle's famous dress. Right. There is a poster for a movie called Dial D for Dead, which is a play on an Alfred Hitchcock movie called <laughs> Dial, Dial M. M for Murder. Yeah. So there's just all these little things thrown in there. <laughs> I have the completely random note that I do still just want to throw out there. I really like Barbara's civilian clothes in this outfit. I just want to point it out. You're a fan of Phil Phil Barassa and, and Christopher Jones's like costuming on people in their civilian clothes. Did you say something about that with Zatanna? As I well? did. I liked Zatanna's dress in one episode. <laughs> like it's important. You could just be throwing these people in t-shirts and jeans, but you're putting in an effort to making sure that you're still carrying these characters like personalities in their <laughs> costuming. Barbara has a cute little vintage outfit going on. I like it. It's cute. <laughs> and also with that. I really liked McGann's outfit in this thing, but it's for completely different reasons because it's kind of a mix of like the jeans and sweater look that she wears in season two and kind of in season three mixed with like her season one color palette and Marie Logan's design from season one all rolled into one. And I like it. I don't I'm not sure if they're trying to go for some sort of thing of all of her different personality stuff layering on top of each other. But I think it's there, and it's there in the visuals, and I like it. We also have stuff like the Hello Megan bits have a laugh track, have a written out laugh track, which is such a good touch. Yep. I also love that with those Hello Megan bits, they have the idea that Garfield has watched the show enough times that he knows it by heart. He knows what episode they're in immediately. Like he hears like one line of dialogue and he's like, oh, we're in the episode where McGann has to, where Megan has to take care of the class frog and she has to sing a song on stage. And these are the things that happens. And Connor's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> Who we'll does go that? From there. Who does that? What? Who knows episodes of a show like that? Yeah, I know. Crazy, right? It's not like, Weirdos. not like they'd start a whole podcast about it or anything. <laughs> I think somebody joked. Oh, it might have been Morgan Jenkins again. Morgan joked Jenkins. about was it? What, what what did she say? Something about that, doing. Uh, a- she want she wanted there to be a reference in uh, Young Justice in season three to a Hello Megan podcast hosted by Emily Howard and Rich Booza. <laughs> right, because <laughs> that's what Neil, Neil was saying. He's like the Greg Vietti and Brandon Weisman gets him every time. <laughs> yes, because Hello Megan is produced by Brandon Weisman and Greg Vietti. Uh, I love it. And just throwing it out there as another little Easter egg, those EMTs at the very end that we right. see have to deal with all of these people in the convention center who just passed out at lunch. They're the ones who find Beast Boy and Nightmare Monkeys and are promptly shuffled out of the room. Right. One of one of whom was created by a sentient street. <laughs> Go listen to our Scream Something episodes <laughs> and hear Rich kill me. <laughs> but... After all of those little Easter eggs, we have my big overall thoughts on this, which are, I love me some Super Martian. We all know I love me some Super Martian. And I especially, especially love the line that they included that is Connor saying, I need to talk to my best friend. Because he doesn't, because he doesn't say I need to talk to the love of my life. He No, he needs to talk to his best friend because that's what McGann is to him. Yeah. And the idea of him following that up with, I don't know where we go from here but I love you and I always will is really important to me and was really important to me reading this the first time. Like before we had season three and before we had the proposal, we had this only a couple of days beforehand, but we had no idea what season three was going to do. And I was genuinely content with that being their closure. Right. Like I could accept them being friendly exes with that conversation and having that be how they wrapped it up and just like they're friends and they talk and that's yeah. fine. And you know, you and I have talked about this before, this idea of expressing healthy relationships. Yes. You know, and like being okay with saying, I don't know what's happening, but this is where I am and I'm going to communicate that or saying like things like, I need to talk to my best friend. Let's not focus on the extremities of emotional passion and relationship and bad choices made <laughs> in the heat of the moment. You know, like let's focus on the work. 
you know, yeah. the real work. That's where interesting drama, personal drama can happen. But also it's a great representation of, I think, a building healthy relationship. And reading this with some friends, because we put this on the TV before we watched the three, the first three episodes of season three, we had this pl- on, in the background and we're reading it out loud. One of my friends, as we were flipping through this, the page before that happens, she thought that Connor was going to break McGann out by kissing her. Because that is such a trope that gets used in yep. so many of these things of like, I'm showing you that you're the real you and that I love you by kissing you and whatnot. But this to me is so much more powerful because mm-hmm. it's not, it's not everything's wrapped up and I'm in love with you and yay, big kiss that'll make all the fans scream. It's like, no, wait a second. I don't know what's happening, but I need you to know this. Yeah. And that matters. And there's a difference between those two moments and the way those two moments would be told. And I like this one a lot better in this context. I think this is more powerful and better for this story that they're telling. You know, for me, I I mentioned on the show, we've talked about this quite a bit, this idea that I was not sure I even wanted them to be back together. Which I totally understand. Because what she did was like, like almost inexcusable. Yes. Of all the stories, if they were were handed one issue, (laughs) we're giving you one issue and it's going to air the day before (laughs) and people can read this. What story are you going to tell with a two-year time jump? And it could have been anything. I needed it to be this. I needed this. Yeah. Because I think if I had gone straight into season three in that first episode, I'm not exactly sure how I would have felt about it. I think I would have just felt like I need the writers to address this more before I'm okay with a straight into proposal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I completely agree. Mm, but this was enough. It was enough for me. It was still like, okay. But they said it at the beginning of the two-year time jump. Yes. That is part of was it for me. Which was also very helpful. And before they did the proposal, they were doing the same thing we just talked about. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about in the first episode review. Yeah. This idea of this healthy relation. Like, I can. you're showing me that they care. They're addressing issues. They're talking. They're not just making stupid decisions based on passion they're actually yeah. having a relationship and i i just i needed it and they point out how this is after their road trip to mars that they take at the end of season two yeah. and part of the reason that connor is being so standoffish at the beginning of this issue is that when they were on mars they were getting along really well to the point that beast boy even thought they might start dating again and that scared Connor. Yeah. Because he was Reason- like, I, I think reasonably so. Yeah. Because he was like, wait, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I can very easily see Connor being like, this is something I may want, but I don't know if I should want. And having to take right. that step back and have that conversation. I don't know. I mean, I, I know some people <laughs> who have gone back into relationships after they had left them, thought things had been fixed and gone back into them and having it just be the same pattern show up again. So I think it's so healthy for Connor to be like, no, you know what? No, <laughs> like I, there was I a reason I got to step away. I, I think it's, and all of this feels like I get it, like I'm nodding at it. And I think because I'm getting it is the, is why I felt like it was okay to go two years later, jump, you know, do, do the, I was gonna say jump into, wouldn't have been jump into, but like go into jumping in the story where he's proposing. It all mattered because I was reading it and it made, it was like, yes, this feels real. This feels yes. right. And like, with me thinking that this could have been their closure of just having them be friends. Like there's the stuff that they point out about Sandra Stanion and Jonathan Lord falling in love and getting married, getting divorced, but then staying friends and occasionally doing whatever and how that all worked out for them. And I thought when I was reading it for the first time that that might have been like a kind of parallel that they were setting up for Super Martian in this issue of like letting them be friendly exes because that whole conversation happens in the background of a panel between Mm, McGann and Connor having a conversation. Sneaky. And or maybe it's meant to be a contrast of showing these two different relationships and how two things that start off similarly can have very different outcomes. I don't know. I want to have hopes for a wedding next this season. (laughs) That's what I want. <laughs> right. Well, one way or the other, the, I mean, clearly they're keeping the they're keeping tight to the through line of the story. Let's talk about let's have relationships discussed and different kinds of relationships and what's exactly. happening. Yeah. And I highly recommend, as we are getting to the end of my notes here, I highly recommend that people go check out the Young Justice Spectacular Spider Man Gargoyles crossover radio play. That wait, Craig wait, Weissman you forgot made. one. Also, Black <laughs> Manta Celebrity Black Hot Manta Tub. Celebrity Hot Tub <laughs> thrown in there on the commercial breaks. <laughs> That Greg Weissman made happen at Convergence 2018, 
And you may be wondering why. Well, it's basically the same story as this comic, but with Spider-Man and Gargoyles also thrown in there at the convention center. And it's hilarious. Um, And there are actually a few moments in this story that, to me, work a little better in that context. Uh, Like that moment I pointed out with the dialogue about Sandra Stanion and Jonathan Lord (laughs) in the radio play is done those questions are asked by a very small girl whose name in the credits is spitfire because her first question is when's wally coming back to which greg just goes that's not in the script (laughs) and they have a whole back and forth and she's like fine and just starts asking about like why did your divorce fail (laughs) like she's just the most precocious little like 10 year old (laughs) and it's hilarious and like that moment i'm like oh i get why this is here whereas that the full like hilarity of that moment doesn't come across in the comic and like you get the laugh track and stuff that are hilarious and you also get to hear what mcgann's torch song at the end of this comic is supposed to sound like because christopher carter one of the young justice composers actually wrote music for it and they had an actress sing it at this panel and she does a phenomenal job and it's beautiful like honestly it's great Check yeah. it out. It's a it's a panel where I was both laughing hysterically and then it got to that moment and I'm like, oh my heart. Oh yeah. man, <laughs> I want to hug you. There's there's a whole thing just at the beginning about Gargoyle, Spectacular Spider Man, and Young Justice talking <laughs> oh. about talking about what year it actually is and yeah. why and continuity in animated series. It is hilarious. It is hilarious. And there's like a whole thing in the, in the panel version where like Superboy and Miss Martian were not at this con for a mission in this original draft. They just went <laughs> and then everyone's like, Connor, why would you go to a film festival with your ex-girlfriend? And he's like, it's complicated. Shut up. Leave me alone. Let me deal with my emotions <laughs> in this corner over here. <laughs> We'll have a link to that convergence uh, thing in in the show notes as well. It is all um, on YouTube. It is fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. And there's more than one of these. There's a, they're around. He does the. He yes. used to do these crossover. They have done these things. for a couple of years. We're only pointing out this one just because it's basically a rough draft of this comic. <laughs> the the uh, the voice actors, like the fans that they get to do these voices, like the the dude doing the opening gargoyles scroll. As soon as he opened his mouth, I my jaw was on the floor. It was so good. And it's the thing that makes these even more impressive to me is they have pointed out the the Convergence radio plays that they've done over the past years are written, cast, rehearsed, and performed in about three days. Yep. They did this. They did a musical crossover radio play (laughs) in three days. They had one rehearsal, and it's still fantastic. Right. And Chris Carter was like, yeah, okay, let's do it a musical. And Greg's like, I guess we're doing that now. Let's do that. (laughs) (laughs) Crazy. Uh, Neil pointed out some stuff too here. Of course, his 1616 is the very first time code is actually 1616, you know, Eastern Daylight Time, uh, of course. The Silver Blade that they talk about, the Silver Blade comic, or it's not a comic, it was a 12-issue really? comic. Yeah, but in the in the comic, it's a movie, but the movie poster with Jonathan Lord and Sandra, Sandra Stan, Stanion. Uh, it's from like 1988. Let's see, he says, the A Triarch film pictures in the bottom of the poster is in reference to the film company from the Silver Blade comics. He said, sadly, it isn't the Triarch that are a set of extraterrestrial deities in the DC universe. It does end up having Jonathan Lord getting the power to transform into any of his previous characters from his movies. <laughs> which is interesting. He mentions that at the bottom of the, the D for dead dial D for dead is Poster. there's a list of actors and they, all those actors start in Casablanca. Apparently I didn't catch that. Neither did I. I didn't catch very, it. I haven't even cool looked back to check detail. it. Um, <laughs> we'll just believe you. <laughs> right. And then I, I felt like this too. I don't know if this is true, but Neil said, I'd be super interested to hear about all the real world people hidden in the background of all these panels. <laughs> because there's that scene, like the, the thing where you see the Phantom of the Opera, like the old school yeah, Phantom the of the big, Opera. The big over our like down shot on the, on the yeah. convention center. There's I a lot know. of people in there and I'm looking at them and I'm going, these don't look like generic, generic <laughs> model number three background. Like these look like, specific people and uh if we get chris jones christopher jones back on i want to i want to ask him if he did something specific with so, you know we may we may just be kind of tinfoil hat 
to we, we we're doing a lot of tinfoil hat this t- <laughs> because we only have 13 episodes of the show so far and a comic. So yeah. anyway, all yeah. right, that's fantastic. So go check all that out. I can't wait to hear. I haven't actually heard uh, the singing of that song, so I can't wait to go check that out. Do it. It breaks my heart. Fantastic. So all right, well, let's let's roll into some artistic license. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't call us sidekicks. Uh, in artistic license, we'll be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novel collections, both from DC and other companies who have titles we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic license is designed to give you an on-ramp onto the classic story arcs of the past so that you might catch a glimpse of what's coming in the future. We've been doing we'll, we'll do fan services and things in our regular episodes, but this was a I think this was a good spot to recommend the Grayson. I, I almost said miniseries, just because the run only went about twenty issues, it yeah. went a little less than two years, and it's when um, we mentioned it briefly in our Scream Something episodes. Uh, but this is the run where Dick leaves the Nightwing mantle behind, and he becomes a secret agent for a group called Spiral. We don't know what Dick was doing for the two years between season two and season three. But with the spiral technology that is obviously shown that we saw in those first three episodes, I'm betting it's some version of something happening in this run. So I don't know yet. Um, we haven't seen enough, but that I that I know of, unless there's stuff hidden in the background that we haven't caught it yet. <laughs> anyway, it so you can check possible. those. Out. It's always possible. It continues to be possible. So uh, anyway, check out that run. You can find it both, uh, of course, on Comixology. You can find back issues at your friendly local bookstore. So check that out. Comic store, please go check out your friendly local comic store and support them. Uh, or if you already have DC Universe, you can check them out there as well. And with that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series and hopefully support more issues of comics, that would be great. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And if you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.